This is a, a webinar uh, entitled COVID-19 and the Importance of WASH for Businesses. This is a, a, an event that's being organized by WASH for Work, which is itself a multi-stakeholder consortium of uh, leading businesses, uh, UN agencies, NGOs, and other networks focused on the issue of WASH. Uh, the consortium was launched in 2016 with a mission to accelerate business action on WASH in the workplace, WASH in supply chains, and WASH in communities where workers live. And the underlying concept uh, behind WASH for Work uh, is that uh, stakeholders working together can do more to scale uh, and accelerate the action. Uh, on WASH uh, in the business community. And over the years, we have developed resources, a framework for action on WASH, uh, developed empirical data that demonstrate the business case for taking ash action on WASH. And just like many organizations uh, that have had to confront uh, how to reorient and prioritize uh, work in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we have opted to uh, um, prioritize uh, this issue uh, and to recommit uh, to uh, addressing COVID-19 and, and uh, viral diseases and its implications for uh, hand hygiene and clean water and to focus uh, our work uh, this year on providing uh, insights uh, for uh, businesses on the resources and the actions that, that companies can take uh, to uh, address this issue. So I'm gonna do a little bit of an agenda review and then I'm gonna hand over to Kate Holm with WaterAid who serves as the Wash for Work uh, Chair. So uh, Kate's gonna talk a bit about uh, COVID-19 and WASH and lay the groundwork for this discussion. And then we have uh, three panelists one each from three segments of society, uh, NGO, uh, a company that's taking action at the site level and share some of that experience, uh, and then uh, a UN agency talking about their work on COVID-19. We're then going to uh, go to uh, Tom Williams, uh, who's going to talk about an updated version of uh, the WASH pledge uh, that WBCSD has developed. And then we're going to open it up for a Q&A discussion uh, that uh, we're going to encourage people to uh, input their questions in uh, the Q&A function, although truth be told, we'll also be checking the chat in case you get it wrong and put it in the wrong place. Uh, and then at the end of that session, I'm going to hand uh, back to uh, Kate Holm to synthesize some of the key insights that have come out of the discussion. So with that, Kate, over to you. Lovely. Um, so hello, as Jason said, I'm Kate from WaterAid and um, we've recently taken on the role of Chair of Wash for Work, along with Michael Alexander from Diageo as the Vice Chair. So at WaterAid, we're really excited to be chairing Wash for Work, which, as Jason mentioned, aims to mobilise business to address wash challenges in the workplace, across supply chains and in communities where companies operate. And in the light of COVID, the importance of this coalition has never been more apparent. So we stand at a pivotal moment as we see the pandemic so alarmingly highlighting the critical role of WASH for business sustainability. As we've all seen, IMF is predicting a 3% dive to global GDP in 2020 due to COVID, the biggest economic downturn in almost a century. Almost overnight, we've seen the role of clean water and good hygiene as a stimulator for workforce health and business resilience become a boardroom priority. Physical distancing and hand washing are the first line defense against the spread of infection and will form the foundation of return to work practices. But as we know, in the global south, complying with these preventative behaviors can be a daily challenge. So business support is going to be required to make that possible. And although the immediate concern for business is, of course, to get workers back in a safe and sustainable way, the reality is that well beyond COVID, what this has exposed is the vulnerability in our systems. And I know it's stating the obvious, but where there's no safe water, effective hygiene and hand washing simply isn't possible. 
So investments made now to enable workers to return to work safely aren't only a short-term response for this current crisis, but they're essential for longer-term business sustainability to ensure that in the future, business is more resilient to viruses, but also other shocks around health than even climate. Safe wash is the basic requirement from which everything else can flow. Wash for Work provides a platform for sharing knowledge and resources on important topics like today's webinar. And we're always keen to welcome new members, business or non-business, to join the initiative. And I think on the next slide, you'll see a list of the current members um, of Wash for Work. So just very briefly, um, if we can ping the slide on, a quick outline of WaterAid's response to COVID. For WaterAid, our emergency response, I don't know if the slide's moved, I can't see it shift. If you go one more, that'd be fab, my man. Um, for WaterAid, yes, our emergency response consists of a multi-country initiative on hygiene promotion. The aim being, of course, to promote hygiene nationwide to prevent COVID spread. So all 26 of water aid countries as a basic minimum will amplify key hygiene behaviours using mass media, digital channels, social media, in coordination with national government and the broader wash sector. And workplace wash is a priority for water aid because we recognise the prolonged periods of time that people come together and interact in the workplace, whether that's in the workplace of your own operations or those beyond your fence line in your supply chains. However, workplace wash must also be coupled with good wash in the communities where those workers live for it to be really effective. So at WaterAid, we've developed guidance for the business sector to help support the safe return to work for global supply chain workers. It's made up of a short guide and a useful illustration, which you can see on your screens. And you can access this both through the WaterAid and the Wash for Work websites as a resource to help you as you're thinking through your own company's response. So let's get straight to the substance of today's webinar. Um, I'm delighted to introduce you to today's panel who will be discussing what business can do in response to COVID. We have three panelists, Dr. Om, who is a behavior change scientist and senior wash manager for hygiene at WaterAid. We have Ingi, who is deputy director of sustainability and stakeholder engagement at Asia Pulp and Paper. And we have Kellyanne Naylor, who is the Associate Director for Water Sanitation and Hygiene at UNICEF. So welcome. Um, each panellist will speak for a few minutes before we move into a discussion. And later, Jason will be inviting questions from everyone. So if you think of questions as we go through, please do start popping them in the Q&A box, as Jason said, and we can aim to address as many of those as we can at the end of the webinar. So Om, if we could start with you, um, could we ask you to share some practical insights with the audience on hygiene behaviour change and applied tailor COVID hygiene messaging for businesses? And if you can also share a little more about the water aid guidance for business that has been developed. Thank you, Kit. Um, everyone, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Hope you can hear me. Um, as you mentioned, Kit, this is an unprecedented scenario. We all are experience each one of us are impacted from the global pandemic lack of vaccines and medicine meaning we need to strongly focus on preventing measures to reduce the spirit of virus was and more importantly hygiene behavior trends including hand washing with soap is the first line of defense to COVID-19 but for these this is the moment we all need to act together to change the behavior of the people for a generation on a massive scale and we can make sure that our business and work is these are resilient to these kind of pandemics. Today, very pleased to speak on what can business do in response to COVID-19. So can we go to the next slide, please? COVID-19, this global pandemic adversely impacted the workforce and business. Currently, the many countries are in lockdown and country lockdown measures further created an uncertainty and have impacted the supply chain. The scale of the challenge is massive. Supply chain workers are at greater risk in getting and transmitting the disease because of the volume of the workers working together and likelihood of touching frequently touched surfaces in factories and also in the field. Government agencies may not prioritize factories and informal settlements 
in the priorities. And this has been evident in past. Workers' movement from their residents to the workstations will add additional risks and threats on them, as well as for other getting and transmitting the virus. The frequency of interaction needed in the workplace and also into the field with the products and individual also pose additional risks. At the same time, the fear of losing job and reduce work hours and future uncertainty creates uh, lots of anxiety and stress among workers. At the same time, COVID-19 creating an operational challenge for the business. It is important to mitigate and manage those challenges and also vital to look after the health and well-being of the workers for the humanity as well as for business continuity. The condition of the work stations and health workers um, and, and the, the health of the workers has been a reputational challenge for many business before and COVID-19 adds a more additional risk into it. It is important to ensure the safe return of the workforce into the workplace to meet the business demand as well as to ensure the quality products. But there is no normal, there will be no normal before we have the vaccine in place, which is unlikely maybe in another year or so. So it is therefore the institutional responsibility for business sector to address the worst challenges within the workforce and also ensuring robust hygiene practices and products in place as well as surrounding communities is vital. Before workers start coming into the workstation, it is also equally important to fulfill some of the regulatory requirements, which might also add the challenges for the business sector. Since was and in particular hygiene products and behaviors are critical in workplace to prevent the spread of disease, it is important to act now. Can we go to the next slide, please? But how and what could be done? Based on what we years of experience working in the sector and our current response to COVID-19 in 26 countries. We would like to propose some of the solutions, but of course these solutions need to be more context specific. And what we are currently implementing our hygiene response in 26 countries, in, um, in healthcare centers, in the schools, um, in communities, as well as in, in the workplace in few countries, including Bangladesh and India. Firstly, what need to be done? What should be done? Firstly, we need to be mindful that different work settings pose a different threat and people's behaviors are determined in the settings where people work. The behaviors are actually determined in the settings where behavior happens. So you see the picture in the top left in the garment factory versus in the, in the right left in the tea plantation area for an example, for, for as an example. So you can see, you, you, you can expect lots of threats, barriers in those settings as well. So therefore, defining work settings and target population is quite vital. The second, it is important to agree on the key behaviors to be focused. Based on the current evidence, it is important that we can promote five behaviors in order to prevent the spread of the disease. Of course, hand washing with soap um, and water, at least 20 seconds has been first line of defense and there are critical moments on those respiratory hygiene respiratory hygiene particularly uncovering nose and mouth sneezing and wearing a mask in workplace is a second behavior that we should be definitely prioritizing it maintaining physical distancing is a key at least two meters distance but this might be a challenging behavior for many of the the organization we really need to think how this is possible in the current structure you have and how this is going to be feasible in the informal settlements where well, majority of the factory workers are cleaning frequently surfaces in phones, tablets, table thinking, tap stands, and all of these does require the placement of the behavioral products in a behavioral place with the visual nursing and cues. And lastly, stay at home or the sick the seeking medical attention are quite vital behaviors. But at the same time, we should not forget the people should be drinking water when they go for work. So availability of cleaning, drinking, clean drinking water and the behavioral products in behavioral base is quite vital. For any behaviors to be performed, it is also essential to have behavioral products in the right location. For instance, for hand washing, for example, hand washing facilities in key locations with soap and water, particularly if we are um, uh, making it hand washing facility more robust, it has to be hands free. The hand washing facility should not be posed as a risk, should not be seen as an epicenter in terms of transmitting disease. For respiratory hygiene, for example, in order to practice this, the protective equipments such as masks, gloves are also needed, as well as the waste collecting containers needed. So these products need to be in a specific locations in a work, workplace so that people can enjoy it. Once the behaviors are clear, 
We also need to develop a holistic operational plan throughout the supply chain. It is always imperative and also important to conduct uh, HACCP analysis critical control point methods, um, the understanding the critical points. I think more those approaches are used mostly in industrial in food, food safety, but it can be equally applied uh, for these COVID scenarios. It can be done through a rapid analysis or barrier analysis process. Once the analysis is being done, it is imperative to develop a behavior change intervention package through a curative process using a multidisciplinary team because behavior change does require more surprising and uh, attracting and engaging elements. And at the same time, we are very much mindful that those behavior change promotion campaign should not pose the risks. We need, definitely need to take do no harm approach. As what we're currently, we're mostly focusing on social media campaign and digital media platforms, at least in three uh, initial two to three months in order to reduce the, the cross transmission. Um, and also need to build the facilities. We also need to ensure that behavioral products such as PPE and hand washing facilities and wash services are in locations, in key locations within the workplace. And also, once you have those facilities in place with visual cues, technologies, and reminders, it is important to implement sustained behavior change programming in a workforce, particularly considering three things. One, we always need to remember how can we stimulate people? How can we motivate people through the motivational determinants so that whatever we say is sticks in people's mind. How can we create visual cues and knowledge so that behavior are reinforced in a behavioral place and mostly in workplace, it is quite vital. At the same time, we also need to think how can these behaviors need to be curated as part of the social norms and habit formation. These three things has to go together. Otherwise, only sending messaging, only putting posters and leaflets is not going to work. We know many organizations still waste lots of money on printing caps and tissues and distribute leaflets for the sake of hygiene promotion is not going to work. We have those evidence already. And currently, the fear is acting as a temporary stimulus for people to run the product and buy and do the behaviors. And fear is temporary. We cannot expect that similar level of the demand is going to be remain for another another few months. So therefore, it is imperative for us to look different motives like affiliations, loves, or disgust, um, uh, in addition to the fear motives. And it is also critical to document the learning. Once we implement it, you have lots of learnings. And also, so how these, uh, the, the WASP promotional aspects, behavioral and promotional aspects is, is actually working in, in the business sector for our business continuity. And the was and behavior change response should also include everyone into the, into the programming irrespective of the is and responsibility. So the curating and ensuring was and was or hygiene resilience workforce is, is key in the response to COVID-19. Uh, for further details, as uh, Kate mentioned previously, we have developed a water rate guidance, and uh, this is viable along with the options for teller response. Um, uh, this, is, this can be available. I think this will be share, shareable in this platform. Uh, but thank you. With the limited time I have, uh, I wish we have more time to discuss. But thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you. Over, Kate. Thank you, Amp. And if we can move over to Ingi. Ingi, could you share APP strategy and activities in response to COVID at the site level with a focus on WASH activities and the outcomes of these practices? Okay, thank you, Kate. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, for those who are not familiar with APP, uh, we are the pop and, uh, global pulp and paper manufacturer. Uh, our main operations is in Indonesia and China. Uh, I'm from the headquarter in Indonesia. Uh, we were uh, joining the Wash for Work uh, initiative since 2019, but we have been implementing uh, water and sanitation programs in the mills and also in the surrounding communities uh, a while ago. So in this pandemic time, I think we feel the benefit of what we have been building uh, across the years. We have been working together with the community in terms of providing access to clean water. Uh, they have now a mostly adequate facility of sanitation and also most of them have uh, trainings and also recognitions of the importance of uh, the clean uh, water and sanitation practices uh, in their daily life. So during the pandemic time, uh, what we do is basically amping up the programs that we have from the foundations that we already built uh, over the years. In terms of the first intervention that we did, of course, the closest and the most important is the employee. Uh, we did what was uh, just mentioned uh, before, 
um, the, the, the standard protocol in terms of the uh, safety measures. Uh, Marlon, if you could uh, continue to the next slides. Um, <clears throat> of course, we do temperature checking, uh, physical distancing, providing uh, adequate PPE and things like that. But I think uh, tonight I'd like to uh, highlight the key initiatives that perhaps uh, specific and unique to ADP as a part of the pulp and paper manufacturer. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that um, we recognize as most important, like the previous speaker also mentioned and Kate also mentioned, is the importance of providing uh, as much as possible spots for uh, washing the hands. Um, in this time of days, the uh, purchasing and distributing of materials is difficult. So in terms of providing uh, our employees and the communities with uh, wash basins, um, we try to see and look around what can we use, uh, what, can, what are the things that we already have and that can be used for a portable uh, wash basins. Um, in the picture on the slide, you can see that we are using, um, this is one of the sample case in one of the big mills that we have in Sumatra. We use uh, plastic containers and turn them into por a portable wash, uh, wash basin. Um, these are light, so they can be put in various, uh, they can be easily moved into strategic places. Uh, we have plenty of those, so we can put them in the most important places uh, across the operations. Our mills are huge. Uh, it's almost like a town in itself, so very important to have these uh, spots um, so that uh, the employee can go around their day and have adequate place to wash their hands all the time. Um, we also try to distribute this to uh, the surrounding community, uh, not only the con well, plastic container from our operations, but also we encourage them to do the same thing with the plastic containers that they have uh, in the community. Right now, uh, in this particular mill in Sumatra, um, we have managed to affect, I think, more than 20,000 families that have this similar uh, washing hand facility. Um, we try to uh, replicate this initiative as well across our other operations. Um, and in terms of uh, what you were mentioning before, Kate, um, is that the importance of the, uh, in repeating the importance of um, daily uh, practices of personal hygiene to prevent the, the, cost, uh, the, the spread of the pandemic. Uh, for this, of course, we cannot work alone. We had a lot of, uh, a lot of strategic partners. Um, one of them is Habitat for Humanity that we have engaged also over the years. They're not new working with us. So they're familiar with the dynamics of the community uh, surrounding our operations. That is why it is um, right now they um, find uh, a good and strategic way customized to different communities that they have been working before in providing uh, socialization, trainings, developing um, campaign materials uh, that fit to the uh, community that uh, surrounding our operations. Uh, in, addition, in, in addition to that, also we are looking into uh, targeting a larger community. Um, we're working together with uh, the provincial government of uh, the second largest city in Indonesia, which is in Surabaya. Uh, the provincial government have the initiative to put 600 uh, wash basin across the city uh, and uh, ask APP to support them in that. So what we do is that we provide tissue in those uh, portable uh, wash basins in all 600 spots in that city. And uh, that is accompanied with uh, educational leaflets and instructions for uh, proper hand washing uh, practice. We are planning to supply tissue and also the education material for the next three months. Hopefully three months is enough and we're looking into a better condition. Um, if you could move on to the next slide. I'd like to touch a bit, uh, if we still have time, on the uh, business side of it. Um, next, slide, next slide, please. Uh, as a pulp and paper manufacturer, of course, we provide uh, tissue, uh, toilet rolls. And one of the things that we are advocating right now, working together with our supply chain and the relevant government across our key markets, is to advocate responsible buying. So through, we engage also with media, uh, our suppliers also working together with a lot of um, radio and also uh, 
uh, public uh, figures to ensure that our mills is operating um, and try to meet the demands of the uh, toilet paper. There's no need for panic buying. Uh, we advocate for or responsible purchasing where relevant, such as in Taiwan. We also work together with government to uh, do audits to um, prevent distribution of counterfeit products, which is not hygiene. So the, the efforts around tissue products uh, is customized as well in different regions. Um, I'm going to stop here uh, with a message that you know, this is difficult times, uh, difficult times for businesses as well, because we have to create it in terms of address these challenges but I don't think I think this is the best time for us to drive home the message in the importance of the Wash for Work initiative. Thank you. Great thank you Ingi. And on to our final panelist Kellyanne. If you could share the messaging and guidance which UNICEF and WHO have developed related to WASH and COVID applied to businesses or private places and the importance of business action. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks so much. And it's such a, a pleasure to be here um, today. I think we've all been on um, a lot of these different dialogues, but I think this one is, you know, particularly specific because it's really um, focusing in on, you know, how the pandemic is affecting so many sectors of our society, but really focusing in specifically um, on what uh, businesses um, can do. So I think um, just, you know, to start off um, with so UNICEF um, has, you know, is of course the UN um, Children's Fund, and we've been working very closely with the World Health Organization as kind of one of the leading UN um, uh, agencies in the water and sanitation sector um, to develop some guidance. And I'm going to try to if, test my skills here to see if I can um, share these um, into um, into the chat box. I'm not sure if they've come up as links, but um, I think, you know, right from the start, um, we were really clear that many of the, the practices that, you know, we've already been uh, promoting in many of the existing guidance, especially around hand hygiene, um, were very applicable um, in this context and had to be a critical element of the response. Um, but, you know, as um, very quickly this information was put out there. We also kind of pointed quickly to um, some of the statistics um, that we collect as part of the monitoring of um, SDG targets um, 6.2, um, which, you know, showed that at least at household level, schools and healthcare facilities, um, there are major gaps. And, and certainly this is the same um, in, in workplaces, while we don't necessarily have the same systematic data, um, we did find that 40% of the world's population or 3 billion people don't have um, hand washing facilities at home. So this really kind of immediately put the response um, into kind of a, a catch up situation where this kind of um, you know, development, um, you know, issue of not having adequate hand washing in place in critical places um, was now, you know, really part of a critical emergency response to be able to help break the pathways um, of, of transmission. So I think, you know, it's, um, it certainly has been something we've been trying to look at. WHO um, on the 1st of April issued a um, interim recommendation for a obligatory um, hand hygiene washing facilities in public spaces, um, in uh, transport hubs, um, and also um, in private commercial spaces as well as healthcare facilities. So I shared the title again, I'm not sure the link came through, but these um, recommendations have been issued to member states. So we're in this situation where we know what we should do, but how do we, um, how do we get there? Um, and I think another critical aspect of this response has not only been the response to the pandemic itself, but it's been around um, the response to the response to the pandemic, which of course has been related to lockdowns 
um, disturbances of, of supply chains and logistics, which have also taken a toll on the continuity of wash services and also um, supply chains for hygiene products. So I think all of these um, have been, you know, really important factors in going from kind of what it is that we know we should do to being able um, to, to do it. Um, so moving um, kind of from what, you know, have been the elements of the response, which have been, of course, um, you know, trying to put, put these, um, you know, kind of catching up on putting these into place. Um, is is really looking at, at what we can do about it. Um, and I think that we need to be looking at what we can do about it really in a couple time frames. I think there's a question of what is it that we need to do um, immediately um, as part of the response? Um, what do we need to be doing as part of these um, initiatives around reopening, around recovery, um, and then really transitioning into kind of a third time space of how, um, and in UNICEF we've been using kind of the terminology around reimagining um, the future. So how does, you know, we how do we come out of a crisis um, into a situation where we're actually um, accelerating on um, a, a really important global target like um, uh, hygiene. So um, so I think that's how we're kind of looking at it in the work that, that we're doing both in our own programs and, and with partners. So I think in terms of the question of what businesses can do, obviously, you know, the first is in your own workplaces. I think we've heard a lot about that from the other panelists. Um, I think we are really talking about this as a um, community response. Um, and I think, you know, really specifically with WASH um, and, and, and particularly with, with the public spaces is that it's not enough for, for, for yourself to have WASH and to have these hygiene practices, but it's really something that needs to be in place for the whole community. And, and, and so I think how businesses are interacting and supporting to wash um, at their community level is absolutely critical. Um, and, and now I think kind of shifting gears is, is, is thinking a lot about how we work with business. And I think that that's really um, what this platform um, is about, is how do we kind of use um, the types of of business channels that um, maybe, you know, WASH doesn't get a lot of attention in in normal times um, in this crisis, especially where businesses and, and, and entrepreneurs are trying to see how they can re restart their economic activities. We're seeing much more uptake from industry groups, um, chambers of commerce, um, to be able to have business working together as a, as a united force to be, um, really trying to help not only their own operations, but also um, the supply chains. And, you know, we've seen this, we've had interactions with the International um, Chambers of Commerce, with different um, industry groups like the World Cocoa Foundation and others, um, as well as individual businesses um, that are really trying to see how they can be working on this um, across their supply chains. I think the last um, point um, is just really at the, the national and global level um, and um, and I think um, one uh, uh, a specific initiative that I wanted to share um, is one that has been basically kind of growing pretty organically um, out of these um, interim um, obligatory um, hand washing uh, recommendations that WHO made in early April um, was around saying, well, that's great to make the guidance, but how are we going to operationalize it? And so we've been kind of trying to build, um, I would, I think, an initiative or a movement to scale up um, hand hygiene as really a whole of uh, society approach. Um, and this effort um, that WHO and UNICEF are working on is something obviously to link that will link up with a lot of other initiatives, um, including uh, Wash for Work, um, to be able to see how can we kind of use the lightweight global framework to really activate action um, at the country level. And so this initiative will be working with countries to develop country roadmaps um, on 
and scaling up hand hygiene and trying to see how we can bring global partnership um, around countries to be able to launch this multi-stakeholder, um, multi-sector effort. And so I think in that effort, business will have an extremely significant role to play together with local government, um, together with um, the education community, the, the, the healthcare facilities, um, different uh, civil society groups, but to really try to embed this action in a very multi-stakeholder way um, in, in country. So this initiative now we're um, working on um, getting uh, kind of the, the structure and the plans in place, um, but we do plan to be um, launching it in kind of the second half of June. Um, so one way would be certainly for um, different organizations and businesses to take on and engage um, with this type of commitment to scaling up hand hygiene. I think just the last point um, is we're also seeing um, uh, businesses that are really involved as a core manufacturer, distributor of wash supplies and services, um, or a water utility. And I think these businesses obviously have specific contributions that they can make um, contributing to either the continuity of services or the affordability of services and products and trying to make those um, available to the most vulnerable. Um, and, and we see that that happening with a number of very generous um, in-kind contributions, um, particularly from soap uh, manufacturers. And there's a number of them have, that have made these really significant. Um, we also see um, a number of, 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 of companies activating in the innovation space, because obviously one of the challenges is that you kind of, um, to be able to do, for example, hand washing, um, you need to have water. So we're seeing a lot happening also in the innovation space of kind of working across supply chains between companies that are developing um, mobile hand washing facilities that could be used in public places or work workspaces um, but then you know trying to link up with for example like 3d printers that could be um, you know rapidly um, moving them from concept into product um, so I think you know there's a lot of opportunities um, to be able to also leverage uh, business assets um, to be able to contribute to this. But I think, again, just kind of as a key message, really coming back to this idea around kind of what is it that we need to do now, very much in the context of the response, but also how we can really link that into kind of longer term uh, systems change. And I think particularly with hygiene, it's really built around the practice itself. It's built around having the right facilities but it's also built about having the systems in place to be able to make sure that those services and systems are contained and that they don't just kind of fade away as our, um, you know, the pandemic uh, becomes under control because it's not the it's not the first pandemic, it's not the last pandemic, and there's so many other reasons, as we've said, I think, you know, the work that's been done on the economic justifications of WASH in the workplace. So thanks uh, very much. I'll stop uh, there. Back over to you, Kate. Thank you, Kellyanne. Uh, so a question which I'll ask each of you to answer is what are you finding to be the practical challenges and also the opportunities that businesses are facing? And Ingi, maybe we could start with you as our business representative. Um, yep, I think from our side, perhaps the challenges, the practical challenges may be similar um, across manufacturing uh, industries. Uh, we have uh, challenges across the logistics, uh, distribution of goods, and of course, uh, find a safe way for our employee to continue uh, the operation while uh, ensuring their health and safety as well. Uh, but <clears throat> I think uh, those challenges also provide uh, opportunities for us in terms of the um, ABP as the one of the industry that is included as core here in Indonesia and other regions because we produce uh, tissue paper. Um, one of the things that we uh, try uh, to do and find effective is indeed the engagement. Uh, we are working closer than ever with our supply chain to find a way to 
uh, ensure that the goods that we produce uh, can reach to the uh, community the community that needs that uh, in an innovative way. Uh, for example, we try to um, uh, produce uh, things in smaller uh, packaging so the distribution chain can be made a lot easier. Uh, another thing is that um, we uh, try to amp up the e-commerce uh, platforms so the purchase of the uh, goods are uh, contactless and easier to access. Uh, and in some countries like Taiwan and Japan, we work together with the government uh, and the distributor uh, supermarkets to um, schedule the production and the supply uh, with, within the specific region so that the distribution is um, you know, this is relevant with the prevention of the panic buying so that uh, the government and the supply chain can ensure the security that the goods are available uh, on place. Lovely. Thank you. And, oh, many thoughts from you on those challenges and opportunities. Thanks, Kate. Um, in terms of challenges, I think there are a couple of challenges. Um, the restrictions about the staff movement, the promotional, uh, particularly in particular for the WASP promotional actors uh, to actively engage and um, do kind of community mobilization, social mobilization has been a challenge. The second challenge has been the technological options. Of course, we use to promote hand washing facilities at household level, at community level that can be operated by hands. Uh, if we continue to do so, that might have a risk in terms of transmitting disease. How can we make hands free? So innovation in terms of technological options has been a challenge. And at the same time, as Kelly mentioned previously, the only the 60% households globally have the hand washing facility with soap and water. 40% is still not having that facility. And availability of soap has been a challenge. And even if soap is there, people are not using, particularly using for laundering and bathing, bathing not using for hand washing with soap. Those are some of the challenges. And in, in healthcare settings, I think that's the biggest challenge that around 57% of healthcare facilities is still 47% um, uh, don't have the hand washing facilities and so they're not having those facilities in place has been a challenge. The other aspects is of course limitation in terms of approach because uh, our hygiene behavior change campaigns or was promotional campaigns has always been community led to change social norms and so forth. We really wanted to make it engaging, surprising to the people, um, public participations, the, the big events, the house house visit, but with disease that uh, is posing a risk uh, to do so, those um, uh, community events and interpersonal communication. So limiting the, the messaging through mass media and social media has, of course, its limitations in terms of how you influence, how you motivate people. That's the, the key uh, barriers. In terms of opportunities, I think the way I have seen in the last five months, I haven't, I have never seen in my life being in years the sector, um, there's such a demand uh, for, a, for a behavior change uh, aspects. And of course, hygiene has been always a forgotten foundation in, in health and nutrition education sector. And there is such a demand globally in terms of uh, positioning hygiene as one of the, the first line of defense. But at the same time, the, the, um, the, uh, the bit of the truth is many of the kind of bilateral donors or multilateral institutional donors are unable to allocate uh, sufficient funding um, in terms of, you know, the prioritizing hygiene as part of their, their commitment so far is, is kind of little frustration there, but, uh, but I think nobody denies the importance of hygiene um, um, and, and in particular was in, in particular in, in business uh, sector uh, for now. I think I'll list up here, um, uh, Kate. Lovely, thanks, Som. And so Kellyanne, um, your thoughts on those practical challenges and opportunities for business? Great. Yeah. No, thanks. Um, thanks so much. I think a lot has been said on on the on the challenges, and and I, I think you know also I'm I'm based um, in New York, um, which is of course also one of the um, hotspots um, of the pandemic, and so I think you know and all of us you know we're really kind of li living this, and you know we are seeing the practical challenges even um, as we we are responding to this. Um, you know we we are at home and trying to think about how um you know our 
the continuity of our operations um, is something that's happening outside of the workplace. But as we look at transitioning back to the workplace, I think we've been focusing a lot of attention on the hand hygiene. I did just want to also, um, you know, see that also the challenge um, with sanitation. And I know one thing um, that's, uh, you know, has been brought up and, that, you know, that we're also looking into is, of course, also sanitation facilities um, that tend to also be um, confined spaces, have poor ventilation, um, you know, and how, you know, so it's, it's, it's not only affecting one part of WASH, but I think um, it's also, you know, affecting other aspects of, of, of WASH as well. Um, maybe focusing um, on opportunities and just fully agree with Dr. Alm about um, the, you know, the level of interest. And I think before this, you know, we, we were always, um, you know, within UNICEF saying, well, you know, it feels like the H falls off of WASH, you know, and we focus so much on water and sanitation and that hygiene has kind of been the you know, the kind of the forgotten uh, orphan uh, child. So I think, you know, this has really accelerated and, and, and brought a lot of global attention onto the issue um, of hygiene. And just this morning, I was on a call with WHO and, the, you know, they realized that some of the guidelines hadn't been updated since 2009. So I think there's just a tremendous about, amount of evidence and learning um, and attention that certainly this is um, being capitalized on. And I think because the demand is so high, um, we are seeing markets um, reacting. And so I think, you know, when we look at opportunities, um, you know, we do see because the need to get workers back to work uh, or back to offices or back to factories or, or, or back safely into, into workplaces where they are, um, it is uh, really driving, um, you know, innovation um, and, um, and I think new commitments. So I think from our side, the, 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 the one of the things is really how do we kind of secure and sustain these gains and I just myself um, had the opportunity to respond to the West Africa Ebola um, epidemic um, in 2014 and, and 2015 um, and into 2016 and also previously in the Democratic Republic of Congo and I think what we kind of felt was that there were a lot of these good practices come into place um, and then you know some months later they go away so I think maybe the challenge to all of us is really how do we kind of secure and sustain these gains um, going forward so that we can move the conversation to a new level. Um, so the guidance is there, we know what to do, but it's actually kind of doing it and, and, and keeping on doing it for the long run through um, institutionalizing it into, into systems. Lovely, thank you. And I'm aware that we are tracking through time at a rate. Um, so the last question I'll just ask you to summarize in maybe one sentence each. Um, which is, if there was one lesson you'd recommend that companies learn from the crisis to future-proof and build resilience in their business in relation to WASH, what would it be? So, Om, let's start with you with a super brief answer. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I, I just would like to now re-emphasize, again, what I started uh, saying previously, the WASH, the more importantly, the hygiene behavior sense, including hand washing with soap is a first line of defense to prevent the COVID-19 and also to prevent the future pandemics. So the, the provision of WASH services and sustaining behavior change provision in business workplace is fundamental and essential and integral. It should be integral to the business continuity. It should be integral to the staff safety. It should be integral for the quality of the products. And it should, of course, for this makes business and workplace more resilient uh, for future pandemic pandemic like this. So I think making sure that the essential products and behavior change and an integral uh, part of the, the business continuity is, is, is the, I think, uh, key, um, uh, key for us to um, uh, take, take away. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Inge, your super brief um, key point. Right, I think from our side, it really helps that we have a good uh, good relations with the community in terms of implementation of uh, wash activities. So uh, in terms of uh, during the time of crisis, what we're doing right now is amp up the initiatives because we already have the foundation right now. So it pays during this time of crisis to have a build of a good foundation of wash programs in our community and employee. Brilliant. Thank you, Ingi. And Kellyanne, your last few words. 
Oh, and uh, no pressure there. Um, yes, yeah, so <laughs> maybe just, um, I think I would say that, I mean, I think it's really one of those times where kind of the moral imperative is really lining up with the economic imperative. Um, and so I think, you know, we can see so clearly in this um, situation that, you know, you can't produce if your workforce is sick, um, if employees need to be at home to look after sick family members, um, or if the supply chain is, is interrupted. So I think, you know, this is really an opportunity where we can see um, how really, um, you know, putting in place dignity, um, health um, for all, um, um, and, and really with the question, you know, addressing issues of, of inequalities is, 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 is really a critical piece of the bigger picture. Lovely. Thank you, all of you. I'm sure there'll be more questions for you later, but now I will hand us to Jason. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Tom, if you have a watch with you, you'll see that we're tracking a little bit late. So I'm going to turn over to you and ask if you might be able to do uh, an abbreviated uh, review of the 2.0 launch of the Water Pledge. And then uh, to um, uh, the panelists, I'm going to do a quick shot of all of the questions. I'm going to ask you to give um, a synthesized answer, but we'll come back to that after Tom makes his prepared remarks. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, um, Jason, and, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, launch the WBCSD Wash Pledge version 2 during this webinar. So next slide, please. Um, WBCSD is a membership organisation um, with around 200 members across different uh, sectors and different geographies. And we've been working on water for over 15 years now, and we're part of the Wash for Work initiative. The WASH Pledge um, is a business commitment um, that we developed with the support of various UN agencies and launched in 2013. Um, by signing the pledge, business commits to uh, assessing and improving uh, WASH within the workplace over a three year period. Uh, since 2013, we have 53 signatories, which represents um, over 2.5 million employees in 170 countries uh, across 6,000 sites. And it's not just WBCSD members, but it reaches um, beyond those 200 members that I mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. In 2018, we published uh, an impact report, which was actually taken to the UN High Level Political Forum. And this distilled um, and synthesized some of the lessons learned from the signatories in understanding um, some, of, some of the values and the benefits of implementing and uh, signing up to the WASH pledge. Benefits including uh, a reduction in employee absenteeism and increased productivity, um, for example, lessons learned in terms of how to integrate uh, WASH within um, standard operating procedures and reporting, and also understanding how various companies that had signed the pledge um, actually valued it, how it actually drove um, particular actions. And it also started to inform some of the areas of the guidance and the assessment tool um, that could be improved. Um, so next slide, please. And so we took this um, on board with the WASH for Work partners, and we've been through a review process of the WASH pledge assessment tool and the guidance. And with the kind support of UNICEF in particular, in terms of leading um, that review process, we've modified the guidance and assessment in two broad areas. One is to expand the scope uh, of the WASH pledge beyond just the workplace and to also now look at suppliers and uh, also communities and also to make sure that the assessment tool is aligned with other global standards that have emerged over the past few years. So the WASH pledge um, version 2.0 um, was launched yesterday. Uh, you can go to the WBCSD website, you can Google WASH pledge and you'll find your way there um, to the new guiding principles, the assessment tool, and also the, the impact report that I mentioned earlier. So please um, spread the word and happy to take any uh, questions um, or comments that you have online uh, if you're interested in, in signing up to the WASH pledge. Back to you, Jason. Thanks, Tom, and, and thanks for abbreviating the comments. I know you had more content and I wish we could have had more time to go through it. Uh, there have been a number of questions uh, and here's the format I'd like to propose we do. Uh, I'm gonna answer one of those questions. It's very easy, which is, uh, will we be sharing the slides uh, to attendees of this webinar? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, there's one question that is somewhat of a technical question about how to deal with uh, uh, the waste uh, uh, 
whether it be tissue or PPEs or masks, and how does that interface with the uh, broader waste management system? And uh, I'm going to ask uh, perhaps Ingi if you can take that one on via the uh, Q&A function um, when you have a chance. Um, but then instead, uh, for the conversation, there are about three questions that have emerged that relate to supply chain issues uh, and hand hygiene and, and clean access to clean water uh, more generally. Uh, and I'm going to put all three out at the same time. I'm going to ask the panelists to listen to your co-panelists' responses and see if you can fill in gaps so that we can ensure that all three questions are answered in the remaining minutes. One is about what are the responsibilities actually for uh, Western headquartered companies that have supply chain uh, in parts of the world where there are pronounced wash challenges and where uh, hand hygiene uh, is a real issue uh, per uh, Dr. Om's uh, presentation. So what are really, what are the responsibilities of companies here? Uh, the second is a practical question. You know, these are companies in supply chains that have shrinking sustainability budgets, what are some of the quick fixes like APPs, portable hand washing, any recommendations on what can be done uh, that is uh, not super costly given the re realities of shrinking budgets. Uh, and then third, you know, two questions that are really about the harder bits of engaging in supply chains. One is around the most remote uh, 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 aspects of the supply chain, rural, uh, farm-based uh, smallholder farmers, how do you reach them with the best practices and with the key messages and information, uh, but also real, realizing that in these rural contexts, uh, the actual solutions are quite costly, whether it be uh, full uh, sanitation uh, and hand washing facilities uh, in, uh, you know, in these rem remote settings, and it, how do we get around that? So. I'm going to open it up to panelists, and I would invite also Tom and Kate, if you have thoughts on this, uh, please make your responses brief so that everyone has some airtime. Thank you. Who would like to get us started? You may need to unmute. Uh, Jason Ingi here, if I may start. Please. Just to initiate the discussion. Yep. Um, I'd like to try to uh, address the question around practical um, initiatives to address the remote area in terms of the availability of the water, clean water access and sanitation. Um, I think um, try to work in various different contexts in rural and in uh, industrial complex area in addressing clean water. Uh, from our side, we see that there is no one solution fits all uh, thing. So it is um, very profitable to engage the right partner to do this because we might have to address things uh, depend on the context. For example, um, the partner that we engage, Habitat for Humanity, for example, they do have experience in practical technologies. For example, um, in one of our uh, villages in our mills, they have the technology to um, uh, have a portable water filter where they can uh, use gravity to uh, channel the water from the river toward a communal uh, sanitation uh, facility. So those kind of practical and tacit knowledge is important and I think partnership is one of the key to address those. I think uh, you're I'm still on mute, Jason. Thank you for those brief remarks, I appreciate it. Dr. Am, what would you like to add? Jason. Yeah, thank you very much. I just would like to address on the what can be done by companies uh, as part of the CSR. Um, so I think there are a couple of things uh, can be done. And definitely, I think ensuring um, the personal protective equipment, including behavioral products, such as hand washing facilities, the hands-free hand washing facilities. Let's say if you are working in a tea plantation area, how can we make sure that there are the number of products available in different locations? There are clean water points available in different locations. How can we offer that the, 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 uh, the workers actually have the mask and the gloves when they actually work in those locations? But it's, it is kind of, of course, a moral um, and institutional responsibility to offer those products. At the same time, making sure that the, uh, those products are available in different locations, the key locations where behavior should happen. One is definitely the placement of was uh, the products uh, in, in key location. The second, the companies can do literally, because many companies uh, we have seen, the private uh, companies and, and, um, and other, 
and really use the marketing approach to sell the product. This is the time for us, the development actors, the academics, and the private sector working together. How can we make sure WASC is sellable to everyone? So how can we make sure that behavior change products is actually the behavior change approach is going to be buying by the people? So making making sure that the package is actually going to be strict in people's mind using a marketing marketing techniques and social techniques is is quite key. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's a collaboration work developing those interesting and the the attractive uh, the package for us to promote um, bringing that creativity and so forth the third one i certainly think the the being more flexible and um, making sure that the flexible funding is available not only for the workers but also to the surrounding communities where the the big companies works particularly in low income settings and we have seen you know, the workers coming from the the informal settlements and the uh, the nearby slums area has a huge impact in terms of how they spread uh, disease crossover in the workforce as well as in the communities, making sure that the, the company also take care of some of their institutional responsibility to work together to address some of these challenges would be would be vital. Um, I'll list up here. And Waterward, sorry, just to mention that Waterward, we have been supporting um, in, in Kenya, uh, Bangladesh, in, in, uh, in India before the COVID-19. And we actually now currently working on also setting up some of the hand washing products the the facilities in place and it has been a huge uh, huge appreciation in those particular uh, settings so i think we can uh, do a lot in terms of collaboration as well uh, between and across different institutions great thank you uh tom i see you unmuted your video uh, if you could say a few words and then kate just to let you know i'm gonna bring it to you unless kellyanne would like to make a few closing remarks as well tom over to you Great, thank you, Jason. And very briefly, just on this corporate um, responsibility and supply chains, I think you know, no longer should we see this as a CSR issue. I think this is a core sustainability issue. We've seen how the current health crisis has closed down the economy and sent some business to bankruptcy. So what business needs to do is to understand the impact of things like wash on business continuity and resilience, look at the social and the human capital cost of that and make decisions accordingly. So I would say that business no longer sees this as a CSR issue, but as a core sustainability issue. Thank you. Uh, Kellyanne, you also unmuted. Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks so much. And I think, yeah, this is a really interesting question. And I think one that's come up, um, you know, throughout this whole response is this question, particularly in low resource settings, how do we kind of step from, you know, where we want to be um, and, and, and where we are. And I, I just did want to say that, um, you know, there is a lot that's happening in this space. And I think a lot of it is really context specific. Um, and so I just will share a quick resource that we've put together um, particularly in the hand hygiene space around working, um, you know, with businesses and with um, local manufacturers um, to be able to kind of develop um, locally specific solutions, particularly for mobile and bio hand washing solutions. So I do think it is something where, you know, this effort of this um, localization and kind of shared responsibility between government, society and businesses is, is, is really important and that everyone can contribute to finding those solutions but I'll, I'll put the link into the chat box thank, thank you very much thank you Kellyanne so Kate over to you to take us home thanks Jason um, and I think I'll really follow up on what Tom was saying that it what we're seeing now is that the role of clean water and good hygiene um, as a core for business resilience has actually never been clear it's kind of moved from that CSR space um, as, as Kellyanne said, we have that moral imperative lining up with the economic imperative. And we're seeing it as that clear essential first step in our response to the pandemic and on our focus for getting businesses back up and running and ensuring that people have livelihoods. So any investments made now to enable the return of employees to the workplace really must have those long-term solutions at their core. Um, we know that COVID isn't the first and won't be the last epidemic. Um, and business sustainability and resilience to future crisis depends on those actions we take now and new working standards and practices around WASH that we can put in place. So I hope today has helped provide some ideas and practical advice. Um, I'd urge you all to make use of WASH for Work initiative. The website now has a page dedicated to COVID, which can signpost you to a variety of helpful resources, including all of those discussed today as you start to consider those appropriate actions for your business. 
Um, as Jason mentioned, the website will also have a link to the recording of today's webinar and other relevant webinars which follow. And of course, if you're not yet a member but are interested, we'd love to hear from you. Just go to the website where you can register your interest and we'll be in touch. Um, thank you all, everybody, very much for joining us today. Thank you.